Hey everybody, welcome back to Board Game Blender, episode 11. I am Z Garcia, and today we're talking about that most precious and malleable of game components, plastic. Today we're going to be talking about games that are made entirely of plastic, games that have plastic miniatures, games that use plastic in very uninteresting ways. We're going to run the gamut here about plastic, so I'm going to stop saying the word plastic now, because you'll hear it a bunch of times throughout this episode, and just let everybody take it away. Enjoy the episode, everybody, and I'll see you in just a little bit. Howdy gamers, Indiana John here with a brand new segment on Board Game Blender called Buy, Try, or Deny. Now, I'm a former audio podcaster. I used to host a show called Game On with Cody and John. And on that show, Buy, Try, or Deny was the name of our board game review segment. So for Board Game Blender, Buy, Try, or Deny is going to take on a slightly different form. Rather than look at just one game, I'm going to show you three games that fit the Blender's episode topic. Uh, one will be a buy game, which I think is fantastic and that you should immediately go out and put in your collection. Then a try game, which I think is a pretty great game, but might not appeal to everyone. And then finally, a deny game, which is one that I think that you should either avoid completely or send directly to Chaz Marler. Ah! So since this episode is about plastic, let's take a look at three games with key plastic components. Today's buy game is a classic and one of my favorite games of all time, HeroScape. Released in 2004 by Hasbro. Hasbro? I know, right? Hero Escape is a miniatures combat game, a light one, with customizable plastic terrain that you can build into all kinds of crazy map configurations. You've got all these stackable pieces, and you've got things like stone ruins, you've got trees, you've even got like big stone bridges that you can put down, and you can build these things however you want, and then it gets even better, because you're going to build armies with all kinds of crazy genres smushed together. So that means that you can have giant robots that are fighting big giant bugs and they're fighting alongside of werewolves and you've got zombies too and well, let's see you've got uh, ogres and uh, demons from the underworld and big wingling dragons and samurai and vikings and even iron man shows up all of these great characters together and they all have cards that come with uh, special abilities and things that you can do and did I mention that you also get buckets of dice that you can roll in this game this game is plastic perfection if you like your plastic mix with a little abstract strategy and deduction then I'd highly recommend giving a try to Confusion, Espionage and Deception in the Cold War from Stronghold Games. In this game, one player plays the United States and the other the Soviet Union, and you all play spies that are trying to get a top secret briefcase full of informa information transported behind enemy lines to the other side of the board. The catch here is that you don't know how any of your pieces move because it's not visible to you, but your opponent does. And every turn you have to use sort of a mother may I mechanic to ask, can I move this piece a particular number of spaces and in a particular direction? And your opponent can say yes or no. Then you're going to, based upon their response, you're going to use this little folio here to cross off the uh, options that aren't possible so that you can really kind of deduce down and figure out how your pieces can move. And from there, then you're going to try to move that briefcase across. Now, the highlight here component-wise are these cool Bakelite plastic components that have an insert in them so that they can be randomized every time so the, the different uh, letters on the pieces aren't going to move the same every time. So these are super cool. It's fun to, to move them around. The uh, top secret briefcase is also a cool little piece of plastic that's etched with the word top secret on it and just a really nice presentation and a really cool deductive game now this game isn't going to be for everybody because not everybody likes deductive games or two-player games but if this uh, looks like something that might be of interest to you I'd highly recommend giving es <laughs> confusion I was almost confused myself confusion espionage and deception of the Cold War a try <laughs> So now we've come to the deny game of the episode, and I'm sorry to say that it is Impulse by Carl Chudik. Uh, Carl Chudik is the designer of Glory to Rome and Innovation, two games that I think are very, very good. Impulse is just okay. Uh, it's kind of a clunky gameplay. Uh, I don't think it's nearly as inspired as Carl Chudik's other designs, and it's just okay. But what 
pushes it into the deny category for me are the plastic components. This is a game about space exploration, so it has plastic sp spaceships in it, right? Very cool? Not cool at all, no. They only have one sculpt, and they give you a whole pile of them. Look at this, you get a whole bunch of them. But they're all exactly the same sculpt, but there's two different kinds of ships. So how do they do that? Well, let me show you. Let me show you how they do this. There's a transport, there's a cruiser. Transport, cruiser. Transport, cruiser. Transport, cruiser. Transport, cruiser. Really? Surely they could have done better than that. And then there's like a marker for the impulse cards that's this terrible little plastic piece that's got pieces of flash all over it. This is like a bad poker chip from like a, a cheap game that you'd get at Goodwill back in 1985. It's a deny for me. Uh, the gameplay is just okay, but the components, oh, there's, we, in the 2015, we can do so much more with plastic. Well, that's by Try or Deny for this episode of Board Game Blender. I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, game on. Hey guys, Tiff here, and this week we're talking about plasticky board games. And naturally the first thing that came to my mind when I think of plastic in board games is miniatures. Cthulhu Wars, Zombicide, and the loads of plastic that come with them. But I guarantee you that if you asked one of the kids in my board game club about plastic in games, they would think of the dexterity games of Justin O. Let's take a look. Bling Bling Gemstone is a game about mining gems with an adorable plastic pickaxe. Originally from Korea, the game has been brought to the US by Mayday Games. To play, you start with a pile of different colored gem pieces in pink, white, and red, which correspond to different point values from 1 to 3 when they are mined. Randomly, you attach four of those pieces to each of the nine gray core sections, which are worth negative 10 points if they are mined. Stack them all up onto a giant pillar and you're ready to go with a completely realistic mining simulation. Everyone takes turns whacking at the pillar, trying to gently knock off the gems without taking any of the cores along with them, until hilarity ensues and there are no cores left. If you're looking for a game that's more thematically sensible, or monochromatic, try Bling Bling's older brother Tok Tok Woodman, or Click Clack Lumberjack depending on where you get it. Another game the kids really enjoy is Coconuts. This one is about flinging tiny little coconuts into cups with spring-loaded launchers. And it really is the launchers that make this game so appealing. They're cute plastic monkeys that when used skillfully can whip a coconut halfway across the room. The game is set up with 14 cups in the center, and the players take turns trying to shoot the coconuts into them. If you make a shot, you collect that cup into your tableau. It's extra awesome if you collect a red cup, because it allows you to take an extra shot on your turn. I should mention that the coconuts themselves are rubbery and fun to play with, which can lead to them occasionally bouncing underneath furniture and such. I would highly recommend picking up some extra coconuts if you plan to play this with kids. Ultimately, the goal of the game is to be the first player to collect seven cups and form a pyramid of them in your tableau, but vanquishing your opponent is harder than it sounds. Every player has two special magic cards, which can force the other players to either call their shot, shoot from a farther distance, or even shoot blind. On top of that, the cups in your tableau are always up for grabs. If another player shoots into one, they can steal it from you. This can get a little cutthroat, but in a super silly kind of way, and that's why I love it. So there you have it. Justin O's dexterity games have massive table appeal and can really draw a crowd with their toy factor, which is what plasticky games do best. All three of these games can be ridiculous fun for novice gamers and serious hobbyists alike. They provide a level playing field, and in a group like mine, games like that are essential. I highly recommend you check them out, and I'll see you back next time. In this installment of Face Off, it is a clash of titans, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are pitting East, West, I think. We are pitting the Greek Isles versus some sort of messed up Egypt. What am I talking about? Well, of course I am talking about Kemet. Oh, it's heavy. Versus Cyclades. Yes, this is even heavier. Ah, Cyclades. Oh, here we go. As always, I'm going to be pitting these two games against each other using categories of my own choosing and my own bias, of course, in a head-to-head -head match and see who comes out on top, in my opinion. So first up, game length. 
we have here. Sigley says 60 to 90 minutes in the box. I think it's about right. Uh, definitely closer to 90. And Kemet says 60 on the box, but I think it extends to about 90 as well. So really, this category is a wash. These two games are about the same length of game. However, Kemet is much more confrontational and gets up to fighting and slapping each other across the face much faster. But we'll get to that in uh, game mechanisms in just a little bit. So, game length, a tie. Next up, components and artwork. As you can see, both games are very, very good looking. And so that part is going to have to be a tie as well. I think they both look phenomenal, really. And the components, here I have some of the components for Cyclades. I'm going to be showing you a close-up of these. And they are quite good, as you can see. This uh, interesting little Kraken. It's very cool looking. Uh, the components for Kemet are also quite stunning. And in fact, they are, I think, a little more detailed as you can see there on your screen. And for this category, I'm going to have to give it to Kemet for better components and equally good artwork. It just barely edges out Cyclades in the components and artwork category. So far, Kemet is winning it. What's next? Mechanisms is next. And what do we have? Fighting in this one. Fighting in Cyclades as well. They both have a lot of combat. Kemet, as I said earlier, definitely has more combat in it. Cyclades has bidding in it. Kemet has uh, a pseudo-worker placement drafting sort of mechan mechanism going on. Um, all of that is really interesting. It really ultimately comes down for me to the combat resolution method. In my opinion, Cyclades has a more standard resolution method, but it's also a better resolution method than Kemet. uses cards for deterministic uh, fighting resolution, but I don't find the system quite as interesting. Sometimes when you lose, you end up doing better than if, you'd have, if you would have won the fight. I think that's just strange. If you lose in this game, well, you should lose. And so I'm not a big fan of that mechanism. I would much rather take Cyclades. I think the bidding in this is fantabulous. The tiles in this one really are interesting and let you build up sort of your own tech tree. So I will miss that in this one. However, Cyclades for mechanisms, in my opinion, really does blow Kemet out of the water. So, so far, Cyclades is winning it. Now let's talk about Immersion. In this one, the Greek Isles, you are appealing to the gods. You are bidding your money to gain their favor. You are moving around the Isles. Uh having monsters join you, though, for a very brief amount of time, which is, uh, you know, a, a letdown. And in this one, of course, you have your parents of power. You are uh, attacking each other. has a very uh, Egyptian theme. Immersion-wise here, uh, it's a tough one. It's kind of a toss-up. It really comes up to, to you. It comes down to whether you like the uh, Egyptian theme better or you like this... Uh, Greek Isles theme better. I like Cyclades myself. I like the idea of appealing to these gods that uh, I am familiar with and have been familiar with since uh, being a young kid. And so that for me works a little bit better. I think it's a, a more stunning, beautiful world depicted in this one. And you are, you know, great heroes uh, going head to head with these other players. Kemet has some of that flavor, but it doesn't quite come through as much for me. The miniatures certainly help, and they are the one highlight in the game that really makes you feel like you have this great power behind you. But in, in Cyclades, you feel that way without the need of the miniatures. Sure, when they come into play, they make you feel a whole lot stronger, but you have that power inherently. When you appeal to one of those gods, you get to march your troops, you get to do something monumental. For this one, Immersion is just top-notch. So again, I gotta give it to Cyclades. And lastly, we come to the Fun Factor, which is the most important thing. Of course, Fun Factor is sort of an, an amalgamation of everything we've been talking about. And so if you haven't guessed it already, I gotta give it to Cyclades here for Fun Factor. Now, I liked Cyclades more than Kemet already anyway. However, when you throw in the Titans expansion, folks, whew, that fun factor is going to go through the roof. 
this game with that Titans expansion especially just blows Kemet out of the water for fun, for interaction, for immersion, for a wonderful board game experience with lots of plastic bits and clashing armies. So, if you're looking for uh, this style of game, I gotta give it oh, to Cyclades. Check this bad boy out. Oh. Yes, yes, this is a fertile land. We will roll over all this land and we will call it this land. I think we should call it your grave. Ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. Ah, ha, ha. mine is an evil laugh. Now die. Oh, no, God. Oh, dear God in heaven. Friends of the Blend, welcome to another episode of Board Game Blender. Uh, plastic is so much fun. Plastic is used for all kinds of things in games. Experience points, diseases, and of course, miniatures. A quick look at how much money a Kickstarter with miniatures makes will show you how much people love them. It's been a running joke for a while now that a game with great miniatures and barely passable rules will still do gangbusters on Kickstarter. And it's really hard to argue that when you see the continued success of Myth. But find a game with good or even great gameplay and combine that with miniatures and you've got a fantastically fun experience. Wrath of a Shardline is the second game out of four in the D&D Adventure System and provides hours of fun, cooperative dungeon crawling. You and four friends clash with brutal monsters like the Legion Devils, Orc Smashers, Goth, and Crash in your quest to eventually slay a Shardalon herself. It requires no one to play the bad guys as each is selected by drawing cards from a deck and then controlled by its card with its movements and attacks programmed for you. The quests take place on randomly generated maps developed by pulling tiles from a stack. Now all this randomness can sometimes make the game difficulty swingy but it still makes for an incredibly fun experience, even when you get crushed. Now for some people, the fun of minis comes from an experience outside of the game itself, in painting them. Now I'm no pro, but you can see that I do enjoy slapping some paint on my miniatures to bring a little extra life to them. Of course for others, painting miniatures holds no enjoyment whatsoever. And not only that, for some people, having unpainted minis really bothers them quite a bit. Add to that that miniatures automatically add a significant increase to the price, and they're not always the right choice. Sometimes sticking with cardboard or wood is the right answer. Take King of Tokyo, for instance. You've got these gargantuan monsters tearing up Tokyo. Richard Garfield in yellow could have easily chosen to put Cthulhu Wars-sized miniatures in the game, but instead chose cardboard standees. In doing so, they were able to create this really cool artwork and keep the game down around $30 instead of $60 or $70 or more. Other games, such as Small World, Viticulture, Terror in Meeple City, and Dead of Winter, all wisely chose to stay away from plastic in favor of wood or cardboard, which suited their design and desired price point much better. I'd love to see in the comment section below if you've got a version of plastic or a preference for plastic. Be sure to look me up on Twitter, at Board Offline. I'm on BGG, and you can find me right here every other week on Board Game Blender. And until next time, if you're bored online, board offline. Hi, welcome to The Bargain Bin. I'm Benny and this is Kirsten and today we're going to talk about plastic. Now Kirsten, when I first thought of plastic for the segment, I didn't get particularly excited because when I think of plastic, I don't think bargain gaming. I think of those big boxes that have like a hundred miniatures in it, you know, that aren't really that cheap. And so I had to think about it. Where is plastic used in, you know, reasonably priced games where it's really effective? And so that's when I thought, a little bit of plastic goes a long way. And we've got three games here that demonstrate that. So I'll let Kristen tell you about the first one. The first game we have is Forbidden Island. This was published by Game Right in 2010. 
It can play two to four people. It has an MSRP of $17.99, but you'll easily be able to find this game online for $15 or even less. Forbidden Island is a cooperative game where players are working to gather four different treasures off of a sinking island. The four different treasures are represented by these four little plastic pieces right here, and I personally think they are awesome, and I think, it, to me, it's much more rewarding when you get a treasure to get one of these little pieces like this than to get a cardboard token or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's a cooperative game, but it's really fun if you manage to like get the majority of the treasures in front of you, and you can kind of like have this nice little display of loot to boast <laughs> in front of your like fellow gamers. So. Yeah, I agree. I think they're an excellent addition to the game that help add a, a nice element of flair to it. So the next game we're going to talk about is a game called Get Bit. Get Bit is published, uh, the version we have, by Mayday Games. It's uh, three to six players. It plays in about 20 minutes. It is a bluffing, press your luck type of game. It has an MSRP value of $25.99, but I found my copy here for the $17. It's like $16 to $19 is where you're going to be able to find it. And it's a fun little game where each of you are as a pirate and you're trying to swim away from a shark. And if you get caught by the shark, that's where these little plastic figurines come into play. Because not only are they just like a nice little piece of the game, they serve a mechanical purpose as well because they help you keep track of your points. Every time you get bit, you lose a limb. And you keep doing that until eventually you have no limbs and you're eliminated from the game. So I think these add like a really nice touch to the game and it's so fun to watch the shark bite your opponent <laughs> and you have to sit there and they have to pull themselves apart. Well, not in half, but <laughs> it makes it really fun. What do we got here, Kirsten? The last game we have is Ink and Gold. This was published by Griffin Games in 2006. It can play three to eight players. It has an MSRP of $25.99, but you should be able to find it online for the $18 to $20 mark. Ink and Gold is a game where players act as adventurers navigating through a temple to find hidden treasure. The treasure is represented by these little gems over here. And as you can see, there's gold and then the black is obsidian and then there's turquoise. Um, I think this adds a really good thematic element to the game because you really do kind of feel like you're going into a temple and gathering the treasure and bringing them back to your little tents. So I think that makes the game really neat. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And so here we have three games that have a little bit of plastic, but go a really long way in either adding to the theme, the mechanics, or just a nice bit of flair to it that really enhances the game. But I also want to point out that each of these games were right at the top of that budget range, anywhere from the you know $15 to $19 range. So a little bit of plastic does go a long way, but it might increase the price just a bit. So that's how plastic can be really great in a game, even if there's a little bit of it. So thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you next time on The Blend. <laughs> Hello folks, welcome to Corner Chat. I'm Mark, and today I'm here with Jay Little. You may know him from a little game called X-Wing. I see what you did yeah, there. Right? Little, you see like that, that? Very clever. <laughs> yeah, there's more of that to come. <laughs> so today we're talking about plastic and game, and I think you know a little bit of something about that. Well, a, a little bit. You yeah. know, it's really interesting. Uh, plastic is often considered a production material just because it's not always the designer who gets to choose what the game is going to be made out of. But with X-Wing, it's really interesting because the choice of materials uh, makes an impact in a number of ways. Right. Uh, for example, with the fine detail that you have with the miniatures, you need a certain uh, hardness of plastic to be able to retain that detail. If right. you look at the Millennium Falcon, for example, it has all of that detail on the surface with nooks and crannies right. and things it's like an that. amazing model. Uh, too. So, so like a softer or more rubbery <laughs> plastic, you would lose some of that detail. Right. But, but not just that, it's also sturdy enough to be able to uh, maintain the integrity of some of the pieces. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the X-Wings, right. those X-Foils and the cannons on them are very, very delicate and they're really thin. But what's great is they found the right combination of materials so that it's thick enough to uh, keep from warping, okay. and as long as you're not trying to actively so break, break them, yeah, right. you know. And, and if you put them in like the battle foam mm -hmm. containers, they're pretty sturdy. Pretty, now, yeah, yeah. you know, granted, if you've got a dog, cat, or small child <laughs> that wants to bat them around, they might be damaged. It but be. you know, f for the size and the scale, 
uh, they really found the best material for it. Uh, but what's interesting too is some of the plastic is clear. So for example, the bases and the pegs. Right. And, and that's intentional too because with the pegs, it helps with the immersion. Yeah, the illusion. Right. Yeah, so since yeah. it's plastic and it's clear, it's not quite in the way and jarring as it would be if it was a, a more opaque color right. or if it was white. Right. Uh, and the plastic for the base, even though you're putting a token over that, the fact that it's plastic gives it a nice sturdy base to it and has enough heft uh, weight-wise that it's not going to be completely top-heavy based right. on the weight of the miniature that's yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, but then also the nice thing with that is if you look at the bases and you see these two small little plastic knobs at the beginning yep. and at the front and the back of each base so that the movement template can fit there. Yeah, which is really cool. So, right. so making sure that those knobs are there, but they're not too long. Right. They're just the right length that they're not going to snap off. Right. They're not going to wear away with repeated use. And it's going to be uh, consistently available so that you can measure. And the great thing about that, I had nothing to do with that itself. Oh, okay. It, it shows no you at all. Uh, yeah, how important the production team is. Oh, yeah. Um, it was actually somebody from the production team who, who looked at the completely square base that I had mm -hmm. made and said, you know, there's a real opportunity here. Yeah. If we make these two little plastic uh, knobs at the end, mm -hmm. it's not going to take any more space. It's not right. going to be that much more plastic. But just look at how much easier the game is oh, going to be yeah. played. You could put the movement template right there, and it makes it easier to teach somebody the game. But also, in a tournament setting, mm -hmm. there are no questions. Oh, it reduces right. so much confusion. confusion. Yeah, so that's that. just one of many examples of how the production team and everybody involved in the process really added to what became this hugely successful product. Wow, that's cool. Um, and plastic being just a part of that. Yeah. But uh, another thing about X-Wing, if I can, sure. I, yeah. I feel uh, fortunate, and I did work very hard, and having my name on the box is, mm -hmm. is really a, a source of, of pride for me. Yeah. But I feel bad that there are so many other people who worked so incredibly oh, hard, and, yeah. and hopefully the players out there know and realize just how much work gets done by developers, producers, yeah. graphic designers, the people who it's do the packaging. Yeah. It's a, it's an enormous team, and everybody's input uh, was crucial to the success mm -hmm. of this game. And uh, designers are popularized a little bit; they get some star they power. Um, maybe not me, but you know, Ryan Kinesia, <laughs> Eric Lang. These names have yeah, weight and gravitas. Really people do. know them. Um, but with this, so many other people work that I just want to make sure that players out there know an entire team of dedicated people who absolutely love Star Wars are uh, responsible for its phenomenal success, not just me. Uh, yeah. So, and that's true for many games, but with X-Wing, it is, <laughs> it's so much. It, it was a long brew time for the development cycle, yeah. the number of people involved, all of the... Uh, negotiations with licensing to coordinate with Lucasfilm. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of a lot work goes into something like that. So of all the minis, do you have a favorite? <sighs> it's like asking what my favorite child is. <laughs> um, that's really, really tough because, yeah, to bet. be honest, the X-Wing and the TIE Fighter itself are just so iconic. Yeah. And my knee-jerk reaction would be the Millennium Falcon. Right, that's like mine. Like many people. Yep. But, you know, I, I really like... Um, IG-88 ship, yeah, that is and cool. yep. uh, probably in, in terms of my favorite miniatures, it's often based on the maneuvers. I love the barrel roll. Yeah, The barrel roll is one of my favorite maneuvers, it's so really I'm just drawn cool. towards ships that have that because I feel it opens up my arsenal of, <laughs> uh, of options and, yeah, and yeah. you know it keeps my opponent on their toes. So that's my favorite maneuver. Um, so I tend to gravitate toward the ships that, that that's can do that. That's very cool. All right, well, anything you can tell us that you have upcoming next? You know, I'm going to give you the same answer that I give everyone that asks <laughs> that question. Uh, stay tuned to FantasyFlightGames.com okay. for information information and updates on anything upcoming. Yeah. Uh, and it's important to note, I, you know, I worked with five years with Fantasy Flight Games, mm -hmm. and I got to work with uh, Warhammer and Warhammer 40K with right. Games Workshop and Star Wars, uh, which were amazing opportunities. Um, and now I'm doing freelance work, and mm -hmm. it's great to still go back and visit with the people that are working on X-Wing and right. be able to see right. that, you know, we really did create a strong foundation, oh, yeah. and, and we created a forward compatible system mm -hmm. that now when they're doing the, uh, the new faction, and you've got later wave ships that they still all work and they, they still, feel balanced. Yep. Yep. Um, I, I think what to me stands out the most, I love going to tournaments mm. and seeing people play and seeing all the different viable builds. Oh, yeah. You definitely. may see a lot of swarms, but maybe the swarms have a different composition yep. or a different mix. You know, I've seen ones that field two Slave Ones, or I've seen, you know, ships that have two YT uh, freighters. Yep. And seeing that there are ships from every wave it just you know warms my heart that you know we got it we, <laughs> we did got it right it, yeah. uh, the entire team involved with the design and the development 
you know, we created something special. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Glad to, to have do you it. here. And you too, folks. Thanks for watching. And until next time, we'll see you at the table. time there was a kingdom of men and it was ruled by a good King Andon. King Andon was a kind and generous man and loved by all his people. But he was lonely as well, for he had to raise his son Prince Colin all alone. Prince Colin had grown into a fine young man and the king was very proud of him. Yet the king missed his queen, who had passed away many years ago. King Andon spent much of his time with his advisors and together they decided on how to best rule the kingdom and protect its people. They would order the construction of important buildings, ensure that food was plentiful and forge alliances with neighboring lands such as wealthy Nexter. Mice and Mystics is more of a story than a game. And what makes this game slash story come alive are the gorgeous artwork components and of course the miniatures. But as the artwork and components are colorful, the miniatures are unpainted. And here in Estonia it's really hard to find someone who can paint the miniatures and who can paint them well. But we found one man, only one, in all Estonia. His name is Heike and he helped us with that. He painted our Mice Mystics miniatures and made our dream come true. As you can see, there are lots of different miniatures in this game. We have cockroaches, right here. We have rats, really well painted, with details on a sword. Then we have a centipede, right here, nasty creature, crawls behind you, oh, scary. Then we have the heroes, like Colin, Prince Colin, who wants to save his dad, really well painted. Then we have Maginus, with the ladybug on his shoulder, his really good friend. Then we have Ness, tinkerer, warrior, with mighty hammer in his hands. Of course the filch that hides in the shadows, his scamp, a thief. Really well painted. And of course the spider, the nastiest creature of all, at least for me. And all those painted miniatures make the story feel more colorful. Make this game one of my favorites of all time. And make the story come alive. And I'm thankful for that. Maggie Bot here for Board Game Blender and today we're talking plastics and when it came to plastics in my library the first thing I thought of was Hyperborea. This monster of a game came out a couple years ago at Essen, had a good buzz to it, lots of people playing it and liking it, cons, and then it really slumped at the store level. So once it got to the stores no one was willing to pay that hundred dollar price tag for this monster game with these cool dudes on the front and these epic plastic minis. And that was because the core game of Hyperborea is a Euro almost deck building bag building game. It came out at the same time as Orleans so it got a little bit passed up because they were using the same resource management system and the cool plastic minis and the giant oversized tiles didn't really enhance the game. They were just kind of scorekeeping. You're making sure your dudes are in the places they need to be but the tiles don't need to be this big and the individual plastics didn't help you feel like you were a specific character because they were just kind of resources you threw out on the board. They're not one guy that is you, it's a whole bunch of dudes. Kind of the way that Cyclades did that and Kemet where they're all different looking but you're still just kind of throwing them in and out and you don't really feel individualized. Um, the cover, the price point, everything about this game screams TI3 and big Ameritrash 
big thriller games, and the core just didn't have that in it. If they had scaled it back, priced it at 60 bucks, no minis, smaller tiles, a little bit more reasonable, the game would have done very, very well. On the other hand, we have one of my favorite games, Dominant Species, and this is a game that's been through three printings now in GMT, which is probably one of their best sellers ever. Uh, this game is super heavy, the box is full when you get it, and each of your six species has a bag full of wood. And I love the cubes, I do, but this isn't helping sell it to the players who are really gonna love this game. This is a game full of war and diplomacy and moving bits around the board and really feeling like you as the amphibians, the reptiles, are taking over the world. You're stealing that little bit from the mammals, you're killing off the insects, the arachnids are killing you in the jungle, whatever it is. I've seen people pimp out the the resources and make laser cut acrylics, but I've never seen anyone make a pimped out species cube. Um, I would very much like to pay to upgrade my copy. I would probably pay an extra 75 bucks for an upgraded copy of this game because I love this game. And so if I could do anything today, I would swap Hyperborea and Dominant Species with their production values and get a scaled up version of this and scale this guy back because more people deserve to play this game and they probably won't at a hundred dollars but once it's on clearance on amazon i'm sure everyone will try it uh, thanks a lot guys and i'll see you next week man thank goodness why are you looking under the table? Your mother is not under there. Could we just please get the shot? Welcome back to Retro Cut. Board Game Cut. Do it again. Hello, friends of the blend. Cut. Not enough enthusiasm. Welcome back to Retro Board Game Cut. Cut. Do you want? Do you need another whooping? Do you need me to call your mother? I got her on speed dial right now. No, please don't do that. I can't handle another beating. Well, you know, it's not that easy. Why don't you try to do it? Yeah, I can do it. I'll do it right now. Okay, watch this. This is how you do it. Wait, give me those glasses real quick. Man, you are blind. Okay, here we go. Hello, friends of the blend, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Today I got a game for you. It's called Forbidden Bridge. Published in 1992 by Milton Bradley, this was part of their 3D series along with games like It From The Pit and Fireball Island. Let me open this up and show you how it is. So here's Forbidden Bridge set up. This is a two to four player game where the object of the game is to get two of these jewels back down to your canoe and back to the start space. You will start the game over here and you will make your way up river, beach your canoe, climb up top, cross the rickety bridge to get the jewels. These are the two dice you're going to roll. One dice has numbers where you obviously just take your movement and the other dice is a special dice with different icons on it. First is the explorer, then it's an idol, and then it's a gem. Now when you roll the explorer you can move your opponent closer to danger on the bridge. When you roll the uh, gem icon, when you're on the same space as an explorer, you can steal a gem from them if they have it. And the third one is the idol. Whenever you roll the idol, you have to push the head down, which causes the bridge to shake, making it dangerous for everybody. Now, if your player piece ever falls down to the ground like this, that means that you have to start all over from that square, making your way back up here, back across the bridge to try to get another gem. Out of the games that I mentioned earlier, It From The Pit and Fireball Island, it was all the same theme. You're an explorer trying to steal the treasure. These were great games all made out of plastic. Please make more games with plastic with lots of gimmicks on them, because they're great fun. Well, that's all the time I have for now. May your rolls be high. Man, that guy likes plastic more than I do.
Hi everyone, I'm Justin from Grizzly Gaming and welcome back to another segment of Two Player Pals. This week's topic of plastics is really up my alley because I have a lot of games that tend to have a lot of plastic in them, whether they are Exodus, Proxima Centauri, Nexus Ops, or even the brand new game Heavy Steep. So let's take a look at some of my favorite games that have lots of plastic in them and I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. Now the first game I want to show you actually happens to be one of my favorite abstract games um, that I've played recently, and that game is called Oshi. It is by WizKids Games, and it's from the same makers of uh, the game Suro. Now, in the game of Oshi, you and your opponent will be facing off each other using different types of temples um, to push each other off of the board. So, much like in chess, you are using just one piece at a time, and they each have their own separate rules. Anything that is a three-story tower, such as this one, will move upwards of up to three spaces and can push up to three other pieces. So if, for instance, you have two pieces like such and you have this piece, here you can push both of these pieces up to three times. If you get, at some point, get to push them over the edge, then you will collect those and those will count as points. First player to get to seven points wins the game. Now, one of my other favorite games that I recently purchased from Dice Tower Con um, just a few weeks ago is quite the opposite of Oshi, which is a very abstract and themeless game, it is Lord of the Rings Risk. It has over 240 pieces of plastic goodness, and whether you're playing the good side or the bad side um, factions, you're still going to have tons of fun. Whether it is enjoying the different types of plastic sculpts, such as the eagle, or the Elven Archer, or the Riders of Rohan, or you're, in, or you're being very wicked and enjoying the Orcs, Dark Riders, and Trolls that you get to in, uh, implore. Um, there, there's a whole lot of different aspects of this game that you can enjoy, whether it's the theme, or it's the fact that it's a risk, or a combination therein. But one of the best things about this game is that when you're playing with two, as two players, even though there's the two player variant of the game itself in which you will be removing a faction, so for instance you'll have a bad, a good, and a neutral third party faction when you're playing the game as a two player game, which is not which is fine, it's not a problem, is the fact that you get to reenact a lot of battles. Um, a lot of times when I'm playing this game, uh, I will tend to remove certain pieces um, and convert them over to smaller pieces so I can have a bunch of archers surrounding one Dark Rider, just to reenact one of the first scenes of the of the first book, um, just to have a lot of fun with the game itself. Um, besides the fact that you are trying to get the ring to Mount Doom, which in and of itself is really cool, um, you can play the game as just regular Risk, which in and of itself is nice, but I still prefer playing the game as the other variant of the game itself, which is trying to get the ring from the starting point to Mount Doom and hopefully try to win the game. Um, if you're the good player, if you're a bad player, you're trying to capture the ring before it reaches Mount Doom and thus win the game for your side. So, I hope you enjoy the show. You can find me on BoardGameGeek.com under the username Grizzly Archer. Take care and happy gaming. Bye. It's Jason Levine. Welcome to another Designer Spotlight. I'm here with legendary designer Richard Launius. Oh, legendary. I love that term. Thank you. <laughs> He's done a lot, a lot of games, a lot of good games. Everything from Arkham Horror, Elder Sides here, Defenders of the Realm. Um, just a lot of great games. Uh, so in general, when you do your games, you do a lot of co-op games. Um, what do you usually think about when you design these? I, first of all, I like to do co-op games because I really like the idea of everybody working together against the board. It's a lot of fun to to 
really when you start your first play testing because you know you can do it with a couple of people, you can do it by yourself, you can do it with four or five people, so you can kind of see how the whole game comes together. So from co-op perspective, it's it's a nice way to approach that thing. But what I really think of is, okay, how can I make them work together? How can I give them a common cause? You know, how can I create an experience? And a lot of times, you know, how can I like put them out on a limb and saw the limb off and hope they figure out a way to get back in? So a lot like, you know, a, a writer or a book would, would, would probably approach it. You know, put, it, put the characters in a bad situation and see how well they can get out of that situation. Now you create the situation, Arkham Horror, for example, and then you go from there and you create all these little expansions and add on to the world as you go. And how much time does that take, or what do you do to then add all these expansions that you've done? Well, I mean, it, it's the kind of thing you're constantly thinking about and, and working on because as you play the game, you're thinking more. But certainly with Arkham Horror, I, I get a lot of help from the from the folks at Fantasy Flight. I mean, they're great to work with. A lot of great designers there. They put a lot of ideas. They brought a lot to that game, and, and you know. I put things in for expansions. They put Kevin's put things in. Kevin Wilson was great to work with on it. And then now, you know, they've just got a lot of different uh, people that are at various times dedicated to to my different games. And I, I feel really good about the things that they brought to it also. Yeah, and we're looking also at Defenders of the Realm here, which is a very different kind of co-op where the monsters are all attacking towards the middle of the board, and you're trying to stop them from getting there. Um, how did you come up with that one? Actually, the, you know, the, the whole idea between this one was, I remember when I first time I played Pandemic, and Pandemic did, you know, kind of spawn the idea for it, because I remember, you know, I liked Pandemic a lot as a puzzle, but I felt like, you know, if we created a much more rich world, I, I loved fantasy, you know, didn't make it as, you know, uh, I guess strategic in terms of, I know what card's coming up on the next three ones, so what is my best move to make, but make it to where, players could develop, move around, have a lot more decisions to make. So my focus was provide this huge universe, you know, with uh, some of the mechanics underpinning it, bringing in new mechanics like questing and, and you know, rolling dice for combat and, and teamwork to pull together and finally de defeat and battle that. And probably the most, the thing I'm probably best proud of is it took me several months and, and renditions before I came up with a mechanic to have the generals move smooth and clean. Because originally there was, they had a totally separate deck. And it was really clunky. You went to this deck, you went to that deck, you went all over the place. And finally I came up with a, a method that I think works very well. And speaking of the generals, you have some gorgeous minis here. These look like hand-painted amazing ones. My set's hand-painted, yes. <laughs> and you, 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 can, you can buy sets that are, are pre-painted, but I love painting minis. So uh, you know, I, I did paint these. I didn't paint the Fantasy Flight ones. Uh, <laughs> Fantasy Flight ones uh, came and they satisfied me, so, so I, was, I was happy with those. But I really prefer to, to paint my own miniatures, especially when I'm doing fantasy. I, I just like yeah. doing fantasy that way. And obviously we're looking at lots of minis for both Elder Sign and Defenders of the Realm. How important do you think the minis are that they enhance the experience of your game? Well, I think significantly. I mean, uh, you know, especially when you're, you're uh, you know, one of the things I hear from people is the things they like least about Elder Sign are the little tokens that you move on the board and you don't see them very well. And, you know, buying the Fantasy Flight minis and using those in your characters is much better, or even just using the characters out of Arkham Horror. It's, you know, since they're the same characters also, you can kind of duplicate and use either the stand-ups or buy this. And I think it makes a very different experience because, you know, we're all gamers. The visual experience is part of the experience. And, and I view gaming as an experience. I try to create experiences, you know, that uh, and put you in different ones. So even though I do co-ops, I try to do them so they feel very different. I mean, my opinion, Arkham Horror feels very different than Defenders of the Realm, feels very different than, I don't have Alien Uprising here, but Alien Uprising mm -hmm. where I've trapped you on this desperate str you know, struggle for survival where you're not heroes type situation. So I try to, I try to create games that uh, even though they may be co-op uh, and even though they might at times share some portion of mechanics, they feel very different while you're playing. And they're also very different than one of my other favorite games and Sam's favorite game of yours, um, Run, Fight, or Die, which has a lot of different minis including the Big Boss Mini. Yeah, the Big Boss Mini was a lot of fun to, to, to put on the table. And when you stick him in front of you and you see him and he's like, you know, four inches high or whatever, five inches high, you're like, holy smokes, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but yeah, and in that one, I, I tried to put the players in a first player shooter type situation. And I really tried to recreate a, a B movie. All 
all the B-movie characters that you could run into, from the obnoxious councilman to the screaming cheerleader to the spunky mom, they they're, they're all exist in there. And uh, But I tried to keep you under that pressure of them constantly coming forward. But then the game dice mechanics give you opportunities to escape what you think is just a sure death situation. I've had 25 zombies on me before. I roll those three books of the dead, <laughs> wipe out that whole zone, and you know, uh, and move on. So yeah, run, fight, or die, and it's done very well for us, and and uh, uh, people really enjoy it. And and it's it's a different kind of game. You know, people. I, when we came out with it, people were like, "Oh, there's so many zombie games out there." I, I tend to agree with them, but there's not a lot of really great zombie games out there. Correct. There's a lot of zombies. And personally, of course, I, I'm, I might be a little prejudiced, but I, I think Run, Fight, or Die is a truly a great zombie game, different than anything else on the market. I think it's one of the best zombie games out there. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for coming here. and. This is again Richard Launius, and if you're looking for some great games from the Arkham Horror Universe, Defenders of the Realm, Run, Fight, or Die, just look up his games and you'll get a wonderful experience. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Real Talk with Sam. Had a little brief hiatus with the last Blender episode as I was out of town. Could not record anything, but hey, I'm back. I love me some plastic miniatures in games. Um, I don't know what it is. It's just something about having objects to manipulate within the game that just makes the game a lot more better. It gives you another level of immersion in the game. So I love games that have plastic miniatures, especially ones that you can uh, have a little bit of fun with and dress them up. Don't look shocked. You knew this was going to happen. Every chance I get, I like to parade this game around because it is my favorite game of all time. And on top of that, it just so happens that there is a ton of plastic in this box. Oh my goodness, look at all those. There's plastic coming out your ears. Look at all that plastic. I mean, it is everywhere. It's so awesome. Now, of course, this is including the expansions. It's just not the base game, but goodness gracious, there's so much plastic in this game. I will say this about Twilight Imperium 3. This is almost, and it's almost, plastic overload. There's so many pieces. Um, some people have actually painted these things, and those people, quite frankly, have too much time on their hands, but, this is just one of my favorite games, and this is one of the reasons why. Next game I'd like to talk about is <clears throat> this little bad boy right here. Tannhauser is one of those games that absolutely has a lot of plastic in it. Now, the caveat being, um, it's pre-painted plastic. They already come looking really, really cool. That's the cool thing about it. I mean, if you open the box, box fired. You have these miniatures that are just amazingly awesome. And they're pre-painted. They're all ready to go. Um, and that's the level of detail that each model has. It's amazing. But see, they didn't stop with the base game. The base game came with all of these models and yeah, it's not a lot but now they have all these too it's amazing and it's really really cool because they all come pre-painted with an amazing level of detail okay here you are that's cool look at the detail it's amazing it's like uh, i mean i don't i don't even know if i want to know who they're paying and how much they're paying to do this but Oops. And they're durable. Mm -hmm. Finally, I'd like to talk about this bad boy of game right here. Talk about your plastic heavy games. That's all this game really is. Plastic coming out your ears. On top of that, 
it's pre-painted, baby. And this is the cool thing about it. I mean, if you look at some of these models, they are exquisitely painted. Man alive. The deep It's okay, folks. And even when they get down and small, they still have this level of detail that is just amazing. Now, some of the paint schemes, of course, are very simple, easy. Just regular black and whites, grays, a couple of dots of splash of color here. Then you get to some of the other more intricately designed miniatures. Overexcited about this, but those miniatures are just amazing. And I love plastic miniatures. I love them, I love them, I love them. Even the little small A-wings are mega painted. Not only are they painted, but they're cool looking too. Z95 Headhunter, yeah. Amazing, I love these guys. I feel like a little kid talking like this, but I love plastic miniatures. I love how they just really bring a game to life. I'm done. <laughs> See you on the flip side, folks. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We appreciate it. A big thank you, as always, to all my contributors. I hope you enjoy the show. If you found even one game that made you think, hmm, I need that plasticky goodness, then I am completely happy and satisfied. Uh, I hope you'll join us again in a couple of weeks where we're going to be talking about an episode I'm calling In It to Win It. We're going to be talking about the end of games. How games uh, resolve conflict for that win. When and how games end. Uh, does this game take too long to end? Can I metagame in this game to another game? All sorts of things that have to do with winning. How do we win? So, again, I will see you very soon. And as always, folks, stay a friend of the blend. See ya. <laughs>